minutes. Hey, welcome everybody. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's Friday. It's almost the end of this great uh, conference. So thank you guys for sticking around and I hope you enjoy. Um, we're gonna talk about practical serverless design patterns or serverless patterns in general. And basically, this is basically based on some conversation we had and meeting with tons of customers over the last basically 18, 18 months. Uh, so we've collected this and it's clearly emerging some patterns that are emerging out of those uh, conversation. However, before I start, everybody tells me that in order to have a good presentation, I need to tell a personal story at the beginning so we can bond, right? So let's do some bonding. Okay, so I'll take you back, maybe dating myself a little bit, but 2001. Who remembers slash knows what was the uh, most popular or used uh, web search engine? Alta Vista or asking its various name or Yahoo or anything like that, right? Most people don't remember. Okay, so 2001, I was supposed to build this. This is electronic program guide, right? You guys pick up your remote today. You're just clicking on buttons and all this thing magically happened on your setup box with, on your TV. I had to build this 2001 on a, on a, on a creepy small setup box with about half a gig or a gig of memory, which was a lot back then, remember? But it was still not a lot. Um, HTML and JavaScript, right? And, and, and you can think about it. So 2001, just to remember we are on the same page. With respect to JavaScript, that's the history, right? So JavaScript 3, thank God they added retry on, on 99 so I can actually use them. But anyway, so there, there was like nothing created, like no jQuery, right? No JSON, XML, everything like that. When you press F12 back then on a Mozilla, let's say, right? Or Netscape, if anybody remember, you would not get developer tools. Okay, and by the way, I'll ask you to write a full-blown application today, but you're not allowed to use NPM at all. So that was the state, right? 2001, basically creating a single-page application because we couldn't refresh every time you click a button. And what we did was create this massive JavaScript framework from scratch, multiple hidden frame, tons of callbacks to back to, to, to backend server. We get back basically freaking XML and parse it and send it up all over to other elements and prototypes and, and whatever we have on the, on, the, on the graphic side. And it was horrible, horrible. But the only thing that actually uh, made us somewhat successful was basically the fact that we used some patterns. We used some design patterns. We used some, some basic structure into our organization to be able to create this framework. So we allowed about four or five uh, customer, uh, four or five developer, not more than that, to be able to just uh, program and code together and to, 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 to basically build it up on time. And it was, back then, maybe, maybe that's the reason I, I, I'm scorched a little bit from JavaScript and I kind of shied away since then, but we'll figure out. It's like, like unbelievable, like printf. Every single line is a printf. It's like horrible, horrible, horrible. When you see it today, it's like, okay, so enough of that. My name is Yohai Kuyadi. I'm a program manager on Microsoft. Uh, I work on the Azure Function team, which is part of the App Service team. Um, and before that, I was a little bit of technical evangelist uh, slash advocate. And before joining Microsoft, a whole bag of startups, as you can imagine. Uh, my team blogs quite a lot on blogs.msdnmicrosoft.com slash app service. Uh, my Twitter handle, your high K. And if you really want to get me, uh, you can send email, your high at microsoft.com. All right. So as John mentioned, there is evolution of application platform. And what I would like to talk about is basically to, to clarify that the application platform evolved together between hardware and software at the same time, kind of at the same time. This is kind of representing the hardware view, right? So we were on-premise, and on-premise we had virtualization, and then you move this virtualization into the cloud, so now you don't even care of actual physical uh, machines, but you are still responsible for everything else. And as you move up the stack through PaaS and serverless, you distance yourself more and more from, from the hardware. And basically, this reduced time, right? You don't need to manage that, easier to set up, and all of this. So virtualization introduces a lot of density, so it costs. And, um, and hardware obstruction basically reduces time, which also evidently translates to cost. While we did the hardware, the software also evolved over time, right? And I'm pretty sure you saw this kind of graph graphics or in, you know, infographics um, several times over the last two weeks, but basically, uh, last two days, sorry. 
But basically, we're moving from monolithic, you know, back in whatever, uh, to multi-tier, n-tier, three-tier, whatever we call front-end, back-end, uh, middle-tier, and back-end, still, you know, kind of exist today. I moved to microservices. The difference between tiers and microservices, you know, service-oriented service architecture and microservices depends on how you take your view on it, semi-religious conversation, but putting that aside, you have services. And now we're even taking a step further and we're starting to break all the services into a bunch of functions, which is awesome. But then you end up with an application with a lot of functions, and I mean a lot, right? You have an API, basically a simple API that you need to have, you know, create, update, delete, post, put, all of those. Uh, get status, everything is async, just that is five, six, or eight functions. You have 10 of those, you have 80, and this is without even adding anything more. Very quickly, you're getting up to a, pos a place where like, oh, what do we do now? And the conversation here is more about like, hey, there are so many moving parts, not necessarily, you cannot necessarily see or visualize the system, right? You not, may not be able to like understand like, oh, how does this whole thing works? Is there a way to visualize the whole thing? Can I basically group some items into a like cluster or logical components for whatever, right? This basically what I'm trying to say is that the, the overall, the serverless is, is very early, right? This is like an early stage, early area, area of, the, of serverless, and there's a lot more to learn. And we are basically missing, we're missing, um, we're missing, we're missing the basic uh, guidelines, best practices, and patterns. And I hope this conversation or this session will help enlighten a little bit, and there is a, there is a GitHub and there is ask for the community and we can see how we can have this dialogue together uh, moving on to the future. Brighter future, I might say. Okay, serverless. So in, in general, just to understand, serverless by definition is a stateless distributed system. You may not like it, you may not accept it, but it is. Your function invocation, in theory, runs once on a single machine and basically the next invocation can run anywhere. On the same machine, different machine, doesn't matter. In terms of state, it's a different, completely different state. So fully stateless distributed system. It's scaled by design. Many, if you follow some rules, will basically observe one of the rules a little bit later. Um, and it offers a very specific programming model, right? Event base. No events, nothing runs. Some events, well, you run your program. All right, so with that in mind, we're good on time. Functioning, uh, function of programming model, basically some best practices around this, and we'll definitely see them as we go through the demos is you really want your function to do one thing and you want them to quick finish as quick as possible. And there is a lot of reason why when we do function chaining, we'll talk about it. Uh, function should be, state, should be stateless. And again, because we are talking about distributed system, you really want to make sure that your function are stateless eventually. And item potency is very important, specifically for API, but in general, your system, you want to create a system that you can traverse back and forth with your data structure. Um, not with, with, with your basically with your state, uh, and when you talk about distributed system, it's even more important because you know eventual consistency and things might blow. So you really, really uh, should care about that. You might notice that everything is a should, but it's I, I can't say must because then people like you know have an opinion. But should is like yeah, you should do it. So um, <laughs> make sure you stick to the should. All right. So with that in mind, basically, what are we doing? We're doing uh, we're doing function chaining, function chaining. First pattern. We'll have three if we'll have time. Uh, as, you, as you know, I tend to run over time. Um, all right. So my guess is that anyone of you who is already doing serverless, any kind of serverless on any platform, is already doing function chaining. Okay. So who's coding today? Like anything on any kind of platform, any serverless stuff. Okay. So keep your hands up and tell me if you're not doing this. Take your hands down if you're not doing that. You're not doing that? Really? Let's talk. <laughs> So basically, what you see here is a function that basically calls another function, another function, and so forth. And one of the reasons we want to do it is we want to keep our function small because if your function gets too big, let's say you want to make a call to whatever. Uh, you need to analyze some text, so you need to you make, make several calls to some services that will do some analyzing on your text, and then you need to put it into a database, and then you need to do some other stuff, and all of a sudden you have five, six, seven different promises running around in your JavaScript. First, it's not such a nice code, B, it just takes time, take resources, and then basically hurt how your ability to scale with the system. So moving on, basically what we got here is if your function receives an X, it produces a Y, and if you look at the chain, basically what you got here is just a composition of all the function. Fair enough? Okay, so far good. But there is something missing from the picture, and usually it's the way that we actually need to communicate with the function. And this is unfortunately a forcing function of what we have right now. 
too many functions in one sentences. Um, the problem that you get from here is this. The Azure queues, those blue cylinders, are basically implementation details. If you look at uh, AWS, you get uh, SNS and SQS. Same thing. Uh, those are implementation details that you need to do, or you, or you are forced to do, you can, I guess, to use. There is no visualization to show a relationship, and there is no way to present a group of function that's changed. Now, before you guys are going to tell me, hey, but there is cool stuff like, uh, like logic apps and step functions, I know there is a slide, right? But uh, just bear with me for a second. <laughs> there is no simple way to basically trace across a uh, function chain, right? So I have multiple functions. How do I basically run a trace across all of them to be able to figure out what the heck happened if something happened? And then we talk about something that happened like error handling. Do error handling here, right? And, and so we'll get to that because you'll have to endure the code of me doing error handling. All right. So um, with that in mind, we have, do have function orchestration in the form of logic app and step function. And those allows you to basically to compose a little bit of, of application. and what I think uh, I'll do right now is basically ask Jeff to uh, join us to show some cool stuff we can do with the Logic app. And while Jeff comes up and, and set up. I'm here. All right. Check that out. What timing. OK. Uh, oh, uh, thanks, Joe. Hi. Uh, so I want to show you a little bit about how we can. What happened? Oh, your resolution changed. I need it? to make sure you can see this. Oh, uh, yes. Or, right, right. Good, 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 good. Yes. So while I am introducing this and going to show you how you can orchestrate uh, different serverless functions with a stateful orchestrator like Logic Apps, you can send a text message to this number right here and just tell it how you're feeling. Just any sentence that you want. You say, I'm feeling great. Yeah. I'm feeling terrible. Everybody in this one, yes. Yes, so great. Message. Basically, this is the new hello world for serverless, right? It is. Right? It is. Like, where you have a new hello world, this is the new one. Uh, so what I want to show now is how you, we could have written this application that you're hopefully experiencing right now by doing that function chainy that Yohai talked about. We'd write one function that would respond to a webhook from Twilio. That would drop something in a queue, which would open up another function, which would go call cognitive services, drop it into an a queue, so on and so forth. But what I actually want to do now is show you how that if you use something like an orchestrator, uh, like Logic Apps, that you can actually build this whole solution very quickly, because all of the state between calls has been managed for you. So in this case, I want to say, hey, I'm going to get a request from some point because I'm using a Twilio webhook. So I'm going to tell Twilio, hey, every time someone sends a text message, go send an HTTP request to this endpoint. And then the next thing I want to do is I just want to grab the sentiment from whatever text that you're sending. So I could have an Azure function that did this for me, but since Logic App has all of those out-of-the-box connectors that hopefully you saw yesterday during the keynote, I don't even actually have to do that. I can just say, go detect the sentiment of the text that I just received. So I have one step in my chain automatically created for me. There's exception handling and a retry policy built right into the engine. Now here, instead of actually sending in the whole request body, what Twilio sends, if you're familiar with it, is actually a payload that looks just like this. This is URL encoded data. It's very ugly. It is not pretty at all. It is very hard to parse. Um, I could have a function that has code to parse it, but actually uh, what tools like Logic apps have form data value are these simple workflow expressions to do simple things like parse some ugly data, convert between JSON and XML, and so on. So in this case, I'm going to say, hey, go grab the form data value from the body property. So if I look at an example of a Twilio text, there's going to be a body property somewhere here on the screen. That's what it's going to pull out and send to that sentiment analysis. Now I do want to call one of my functions because I want to do some analysis based on the function. I'll actually show you the code. So we'll come in here. I'll open up all my functions. And uh, it looks like Wi-Fi is actually working pretty well for us right now. Yeah, great. So, so yeah. I want to call uh, one of my functions here. I'll open up so you can see the code in just a second, which is going to get the score and calculate the text response that it sends to all of you. So I'm just going to pass in the score. And I'll just show you here what that Azure function looks like because it is very simple. And what's awesome here is I can continue to chain or parallelize or whatever else I need to do. I haven't had to write any queues. I haven't had to manage any steps. But also, if I need to go reorder this workflow, maybe I decide I want to do something before I calculate the text response. I don't have to go reroute or change any production running code. I just change something in that workflow. So this is the Azure function that it's calling. You can see it's honestly 23 lines of JavaScript, which just says if the, oh, C sharp, I'm sorry. Uh, if the score is less than this, then I send you all these different responses. Those are hopefully the responses that you've been seeing. 
Uh, so now finally, after I get a response back from the function, I just want to send a text message with Twilio, uh, and I can do that here. Uh, so again, just kind of uh, helping you to be able to build these kind of patterns and workflows faster without having to worry about managing queues and states in the middle. The Logic App can do all of that management for you. Um, in this case, I want to send it back to their phone number. So I'll just finish this off very quickly so Yohai can get back to the awesome stuff he has. So that's it. I click Save here. Uh, this was the one, obviously, I have one that's been running this whole time as you've been texting. Uh, the last thing I'll just mention briefly, because I didn't have time yesterday during the keynote, is that behind the scenes of this beautiful designer that helped me build this, there is this declarative language that's telling my Logic App how to orchestrate these different calls. I could take this code, uh, this declarative language, I could deploy it with the Azure CLIs, I could manage it, write my own if I didn't want to use the designer. Uh, but again, the benefit here is that the Logic App was able to manage the state between all these different calls for me without me having to worry about queues. And now you all get to tell it how you're feeling, uh, which I believe has been working great. And if I refresh this, it looks like it just, it's running right now. So someone's texting right now. Um, I'm actually, are you okay if I open one of these to see what people are saying? I don't care, they're sending me That's text. super amazing, yeah, wow, yeah, this wasn't yeah, even yeah. scripted. You can see, yeah. Which got a great score, okay? Uh, yeah. Great, so with that, Yohai, I'll let you get back to some of the other patterns. Cool, thank you, Jeff. Yep. Yes, and it's important to say that the uh, schema is fully documented if you want to use it and you can actually create your own parser into it or your visualization. All right, so um, this particular example is a good example. It's the, it's the canonical new hello world. It's a completely you know, fire and forget. You get an SMS, you do something, you get a reply back. It's good, so the tools for the visual, uh, visualization, like Logic App, um, helps you basically create that. So we might, save the fr uh, might uh, solve the first, uh, the, first, uh, sorry, the first three bullets. However, what happens if I'm gonna add, ask you now, hey, I want to actually do have a transaction scope around those chain, right? I do want to need to be able to run something and I need to handle error, and I need to, to, and I need to handle rollback and, or undo as well, right? Um, so I wish I could have something that goes both direction at the same time. Uh, well, apparently, there are a few options to do that, and we'll, we'll review two of them, basically. Um, and, and think about it. Think, let's so we go through the chain, uh, just like um, imagine uh, what uh, Jeff showed you. Basically, you have a trigger function. You go through F1, F2, F3. Let's say F1 explodes for whatever reason. So you need to basically move from F3 to, you want to undo F2 and you want to actually undo F1. So F3 now needs to basically do something to manage to call F2 but to undo the work. And the same thing F2 will now have to do, undo, un, have to undo F1. All right, after all these complex sentences, let me try and show it to you. Okay, what we got here is basically uh, Function chaining which transaction? As I said, I have a trigger function, which is basically an HTTP trigger. I'm gonna show some of the bindings around this. Basically, it's an HTTP trigger that allows you to uh, receive a, a, like a hook just to start the whole process. And basically, I have an output item. I have an output Q item, which I'm gonna use, and I'm gonna to write to Q1. And obviously, I have func number one, which guess what? It's a Q trigger. And as you would expect, it actually listens to items that comes from Q1, and func one will write to, func, to Q2. And as you guessed correctly, on Q2, basically, we have, on Q2, basically, we have, uh, the Q2 is an input uh, Q for the trigger. I'm gonna write to Q3, which will be the input to Q3, uh, to function three. But I also have an error here. So I have a generic item called error Q item. And not notice I'm on function two, and the error is actually pointing back to Q1 because I'm gonna enqueue it again for function one to undo the whole mess. If you're confused, wait, you'll get more. Okay, so basically what I got is here is, um, is the following. Good font, a little bit too big, but fine. Uh, so basically it's an HTTP um, request that comes in and picks some, a certain input number and a ratio. We'll see the ratio in a second. Basically what we do is we uh, create a new object here and look at this cool feature in, in VS. I can actually see the object uh, prototype. So this object has a history, has a basically a, uh, a func res, which is imagine it's the input for the next step. So it will include the input and the ratio, so I can carry this with me. History will contain the history of all my invocations, so I can roll back and forth. Undo is the flag that tells me which direction I want to go. And correlation ID is my ability basically to just embed a correlation ID so I can actually have the same traces or correlate traces across multiple functions if I want to. All right, so this basically gets pushed into 
into function one, and function one get invoked, and basically what we do is we uh, check some parameters, figure out the flag, which direction we go, we do the work, and do the work is very simple. In this case, we just basically multiply, uh, which uh, you'll see the undo work is actually the opposite of this. This is the item potency coming to place, very important for you. We update the chain, and we just push it down the queue, and so on and so forth. So to show you this in action, what I'm gonna actually sh do is, do I have my breakpoints here? Yeah, it's that easier actually to show it uh, as you step through it versus just in traces. So we are in the wrong place. Data repos serverless uh, function source Azure JS. Okay, so we're gonna do func run. Uh, we'll run our uh, we'll run our trigger and we'll attach a debugger to it. And yep, so run times run, function host. So, okay, so it's running. Let me attach a debugger to it. Okay. Now I'm gonna just invoke my function very quickly and I'll just add a number, I'll add the canonical number 42 and I'll add ratio and it did not stop. It did, all right. It did stop, it went through the trigger and it actually stopped on the first breakpoint which is the queue. Sorry, my bad, I should stop all the way. Anyway, so in the, you're in the first queue, func1 actually received a message and all we're doing here is really quickly, I'll go through because seeing code is not that exciting. Um, you look at the work, you do the work, you update the chain, and then you, you know, pushing it down, the, down to funk number two. Here is funk number two. We're doing the same thing. We'll go into uh, continue, and we hit funk number three. And funk number three basically is just for purposes of demo, we'll randomize a number, and we'll see what the value. So the value is 92, which is good. Uh, and basically it's uh, uh, big enough for me to generate the error rates to make sure that I'm gonna go through the error rate. I'm just gonna make sure everything goes correctly. So I set it to a thousand. I can do that. And let me set another breakpoint here. I'm not sure why it didn't in the beginning. All right. So basically now it will throw as it should be. So now function three explode, right? So now let's start doing everything we did. We just need to undo. So we're gonna go through the catch. We guess we're basically gonna flag it as like, hey, it failed. And then I'm gonna push it down and this is gonna go to function two now, and the flag is different, so now I go back, and as I slowly go through all of this, basically I'm cleaning up, I'm undoing my work, I'm updating, I'm pulling out the history, I'm changing the, uh, ver the, the actual values so I can properly propagate them through the different chain, and basically I'm going all the way back to my function one, and the undo will should be, hopefully, 42, went all the way back, and all the way Right, so right, and this is it. So it's easy, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty easy. Okay, so this was one. Uh, a more generic error handler and probably even harder to implement will be the one that we're gonna drop everything into a central, uh, a central location in which you're gonna have all your errors there. You're gonna have a function that basically can understand how to do error handling properly and just basically disperse all the error to wherever it needs to go. It needs to go. Similarly, you want to have on your function, the ability to do work and undo work. I would not create a different function to undo function one. First is another thing to manage, it's nightmare. Um, and I would not add another queue because uh, another or intermediate queue between every undo function because again, it's hard to just manage all those resources. So just do the flag and undo, undo uh, do and undo. Um, but at this point, what we're having is the central error handling now need to understand the flow. All right. Cool, so we are just only about 10 minutes behind schedule. Um, let's talk about async. Async is pretty simple. 
in terms of understanding. I think we're all kind of familiar, we've seen this before. We do post to heroes, heroes come back on location. We basically get status on location, we're waiting, we're getting still 202, uh, and we didn't get status again, and then we're getting okay, and we're happy with the result. In between, the API needs to do some work, and once they go to come back, basically, then we're done, and we need to change the status. So far, cool. So we have an API called heroes, and heroes need to do some work. You guessed it by now, there is a queue. But also have get status. And get status needs to get status from somewhere. Where do you get the status from? Somewhere, right? And apparently now, everybody needs to know where somewhere is. So everybody talks to somewhere. And basically, in theory, how it looks like is basically you wait until get status uh, returns with, uh, with the do work. Once that's complete, then the result is basically whatever heroes pass to do work and whatever do work is supposed to do. All right, so quick demo. All right, let's see how we're gonna squeeze that in the right time. Okay, so we're done with this, and now we go to this async. Okay, so we got a bunch of APIs here. Okay, I got my uh, heroes API, so I got my get APIs, and I got my post, and update, and delete over here. I got a data model called hero, and I got an async manager just to manage the states. API is very simple. As you would see, well, what I want to show you is the function JSON, for example. Again, bindings. The cool thing about uh, one of the cool bind properties of binding within Azure Function, you can actually define routes. So now, instead of doing the API and the full qualified name of, the, of your function, basically you can have routes, and basically you can define specific method. This one will be get. If you try to do something else that is not defined, you'll get a 404 as an example. So if you look at the post, for example, you'll see this is a post and the body will conclude the data. Okay, so on my get, basically what I got is I got, a, I got, a, I got my hero class, uh, and my hero class is, is just a regular class that I, that I use and basically represent my, uh, let's just go uh, over here, basically represent my, uh, uh, my state and I, 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 get, I just work it out, right? If I have an ID, if I don't have ID on the get, I get all the list. If I have an ID, I get one list and so forth. A little bit less interesting. The more interesting it will be like the post, for example. And in this example, on the post, what we do is we just do uh, some validation on the data. And I have my async manager create a new entry in this repository, which is somewhere, which will basically get me back a location ID, which we'll use, an a I API, sorry, a, a GUID for my API. And then I compose an object, which include this, uh, which include this basically GUID, the method, the original method to be passed, and actual the body. So I just take a queue message, I create a message, an object that have enough information, and then I just shove it down to the queue. I do the same thing with delete, and I do the same thing with, with, uh, uh, with update. Basically, they just have different parameters to validate, but the entire code is really the same. So we end up with an async uh, do, and the do function here, uh, basically, it's a queue message trigger. Uh, it's a queue item, and the queue item, basically, I just uh, I test some uh, element on that. What I have here is I have say timeout for 15 seconds, and this is just to, on the purposes, just to show you, right? There's an async call, I want to generate a delay. This is a fake one. So I'll go to my fake delay work uh, function, and I have a simple switch here on the method. And for, for post, for example, what I do is I get a reference to my, for my, for my data access, and I just add a hero, uh, and, and, I, and I add the hero name and all the other information. Um, when I'm done, I'm verifying that I successfully edited, and then I'm updating my API call, which will basically flag as complete. I have a, I probably should show you the API call. I'll show you when I run around the demo. And the same thing you do with uh, failed, it failed, and then you move on through all the other one. We are short on time, so let's just jump into the demo. Right now, uh, where are we? This will be easier. Serverless, async, uh, async. Source Azure JS. Okay. Uh, okay. Funk run. Uh, what do you want to run? Let's do heroes. Let's try trigger. Doesn't matter. We don't need to debug this one. So just run it. Okay. The thing you'll notice here, real quick, is is again I'm running it locally. It's easier just to show the demo but definitely you can publish and run it on the cloud. Uh, you'll notice that it, it's override the, uh, the URI, so to see basically instead of API heroes, it actually uses, what happened to my thingies? Huh, interesting. Anyway, uh, 
let me show you. For this, I was going to uh, come up with um, Postman. All right, so here's my hero list. Let me do a get. And this is what I'm getting. So some of you might think those are villains, but from my personal perspective, those are my heroes. OK, so I got my heroes. Yes, people who knows me will figure it out on their own. <laughs> and if you don't, you missed that. OK, so let's do a post. Let's do basically, I'm going to add. I'm going to add, uh, I'm gonna add, uh, I'm gonna add Lord uh, Darth Vader, who is a very strong uh, force wielder. Um, the fact that we have an ID is you can ignore because the post will just ignore that. So I'm going to um, hit the send. And what it will do, and just try to figure out the resolution here so I can do it quickly. Uh, what it will do, basically, it, it passes a URI, uh, sorry, a, a GUI that I can work with. This GUI is also on the header in terms of the location right here. I can go to my location status. I can add this and hit the send. And good, 15 minutes, 15 seconds didn't pass, so it's still running. Uh, it's complete and successfully add a new hero. And here's the and here's the URI and here's the ID. We do this. We go here. We go to get, and you're getting it. And here's Vader. And basically, I'm going to just quickly showing you this state. I just manage kind of a basic state here, um, running and completed. And then when it's completed successfully, you see uh, the result. And if it failed, you just see whatever you want to do. The bottom line is you guys are on the hook to kind of uh, fully manage the entire uh, complex. So. Um, Executing on the state needs to be basically the execution state needs to be explicitly stored and managed, which is a nightmare. And you need to sync between that, which is another nightmare. Think about how this thing running at scale. Think of what happens if there is eventual consistency if multiple are making changes to Darth Vader at the same time. You know, whole mess, the whole force galaxy just go haywire. Okay, next, fan out. I think we're okay on time. So in theory, in fan out is very simple. X represents some work, and you can basically break down X. Not all of the work can be, not everything can be represented like this, but anything that can, this is a great uh, candidate for fan out. Canonical example is you have a thousand emails that you need to send, okay? So basically, one way to do them is sequentially, like we did pretty much for a very long time, you do a big for each, and the for each work, you basically do the work which go ahead and will do whatever send you need to do. On the parallel side, what you want to do in terms of fan out is basically for each, you want to basically push this into a queue, right, or a topic, and this will actually scale out. This is where the scale by design, if you keep some, uh, if you remember how to, if you know how to, uh, this is where serverless scale by design, if you follow certain patterns, this is a pattern. Because if you do this for each, we can, you can definitely do in your function, you have a single function that's going to do a thousand different API calls to send an email versus just making, uh, push everything to a queue, which is a, probably faster than sending an email, calling the API to send an email, and then let someone else do the work for you, and this will spend to run in parallel. All right, so as you would expect, you have a function that basically go ahead through a queue and, or, or a topic and basically go ahead and fan it out to multiple. So that's the easy part. That really, I'm not gonna show because I don't have time, got only four minutes, but basically, the game here is time. It's the same throughput, it's the same yield, sorry, so the area between those two uh, triangle, uh, triangle and, uh, and ret ret rectangular are pretty much the same. It's all a function of how quick do you want to do it. So the more throughput you get, this is what you want to do with parallel, if you need to, obviously. Um, um, the thing is that fanning out is, 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 is respectively easy. You do need to figure out how to do a retrial and do it manually. Yes, we have dead letter queues and all that, but you still need to manage that so it's on your own. Um, and if you want to add some more stuff into it, like chaining, then again, same problem as we had before. So it, these problems are compounded one on top of the other. Okay, while fan out is easy, what do you do if you actually care for the work and you need to correlate all the results coming back? Yes, that is a big mess. Uh, uh, when you do that, it's significantly, significantly more, com more difficult. Now, Basically, every single uh, function too needs to either a chain or a function needs to basically maintain this execution co uh, state. You need to be able to do all the retry handling error, obviously. But you also need to create a sync point. You need to be able to address that sync point. F3 needs to be able to trigger out of that every time something happens. Needs to go and check the state, understand which state are you, how you can actually go ahead, did all the work finished, and all of that combined together. Add to that, if the, uh, add to that, 
some consequences like if you want to add timeout or anything like that, and this is a big, big, big mess. Cool, and we are actually seeing customers need to handle and deal with this. And to code it manually, it's not a fun thing to do, and a demo will probably take 45 minutes, and I only have two, so we move next. Okay, so there are many serverless design patterns, uh, function chaining, transaction scope, async, fan out, fan out and in, actor model, manual interaction with timeout, scope timeout, uh, long-running workflows, and probably many, many more. I got, uh, I got three or four of them already implemented. The stuff that you've seen so far is on GitHub, serverless design pattern, or serverless pattern. I can't even where, remember where they pushed them. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll figure out as soon as I finish my deck. I'll, I'll find it again and put it there. Okay, um, so the thing is that it's very early. Um, um, so you said you're not doing chaining. I would like to know what you're doing instead. But I hope some of this pattern makes sense to you. Uh, and if you have others, please let me know. And I would love to have a conversation with you guys. Um, uh, we can all party on the GitHub, and we can try to actually build some patterns and go ahead with the community and serve it. As again, it's so early. People actually need to, need to have some guidance and understanding how to move forward and be successful beyond just creating and deploying uh, uh, basic stuff. So in summary, I'm on time. All right. Uh, Programming model, best, uh, just follow the, 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 the best practices. You see I already removed the should here, so this is all a must. Uh, use your pattern to organize function into manageable groups, right? Figure out how to want to use them. Use tags, use whatever you want when you deploy and manage them. Orchestrate them as a unit. When you app, my, my recommendation is you have four or five functions chained. When you update one, update version of all of them at the same time. Don't do lazy in just one of them, it's bad. Um, use logic apps where appropriate, actually when you can. You can have logic call a function, a function called logic, and vice versa, so you can create some crazy stuff. And if you haven't tried Azure Function yet, and you like what you see, you can go to AKA MS Try Functions and try it for free. Uh, all you need is a GitHub or a Google account, and you're good with it. And that's it. All right, on time.